Welcome to the South Africa 2020 Scenarios. I'm your host, Lerat Mbele. Thank you very much for joining us. Like many developing countries, South Africa faces a myriad of opportunities and challenges, both internal and external. How it deals with these opportunities and challenges will define the future of the country for many generations to come. In this program, we'll be examining four different possible futures for South Africa over the next years till 2020. After the peaceful transition of 1994, South Africa celebrated its first decade of freedom as a stable and working democracy. There have been many successes over the last 10 years, including the consolidation of democracy, political stability, the deracialization of the political system, and progress towards eradicating the social legacy of apartheid. South Africa has seen macroeconomic stability and steady economic growth. Many steps have been taken towards eradicating the backlogs in social services and access to water, sanitation, electricity, housing, health, education and communications. The macroeconomic stability and steady economic growth of South Africa has also been accompanied by the opening and diversification of the economy. But many problems remain. The scenarios in this program map out what could happen if these problems are not addressed. What will South Africa be like in the year 2020? Scenarios offer an alternative environment in which today's decisions may be played out. They are not predictions, they are merely descriptions of possible futures created to encourage debate within the public sphere. It's collective reflection about the future of our rainbow nation in order to build a consensus on where we want to go and how we want to get there. Over the past 10 months, a team of 25 future leaders of South Africa met on different occasions to create possible scenarios about what might happen in South Africa over the next 15 years leading up to the year 2020. There were six participants from other countries across Africa to enrich the debate with an external African perspective on the future, as well as lessons from experiences in other African countries. This team was diverse and represents a wide spectrum of political, ideological and economic opinion. Building the stories was a difficult process. There was not always agreement. There were different opinions on how South Africa could or should evolve. The end product, therefore, reflects the consensus and trade-offs which were necessary to make such a conversation a meaningful process. Scenarios are the stories of how the world might turn out tomorrow. Stories that can help us recognize and adapt to changing aspects of our present. The team foresaw four possible outcomes expressed as stories covering the coming years leading to 2020. In the first scenario, Dead End, the team explores the possible outcome of uncurtailed corruption and rampant individualism in South Africa in the years leading up to the year 2020. I greet you from 2020. I present to you the 16-year case review of South Africa. By failing to root out corruption, which has now permeated every level of society and public life, we have taken a route which in your time we considered impossible, a disastrous, depressing dead end. The emergence of a black elite in the late 90s and the turn of the century inspired a pursuit for individual wealth. The economy failed to shift to empower the majority. Black economic empowerment was viewed as a vehicle for getting rich quick. The economic elite roped in their political connections to legitimize their path to riches. Corruption steadily increased as backhanders became part of the business process. It didn't take long before those who held public office saw it as their right to a piece of the pie. With a culture of greed and corruption established at leadership level, the moral degeneration cascaded downwards, permeating the whole of society. To bribe a traffic officer or policeman became a way of life. A breakdown of law and order ensued. With diminished enforcement of the law, hijacking, rape, robbery and murder escalated to drastic proportions. Focusing on self-enrichment instead of developing an inclusive economy resulted in three-quarters of the population being unemployed. Poverty and desperation further fueled crime as people were forced to fend for themselves. The lack of development and investment in rural areas 
has caused the flight from economically desperate areas. This has caused mass urbanization that has heavily strained city municipalities' management of infrastructure. Urban decay has been exacerbated by this influx. By now, the unmanaged HIV-AIDS crisis has long seen the collapse of the government ARV rollout. AIDS deaths have depleted the workforce in all sectors. In 2015, the number of orphaned children results in South Africa having the greatest number of street kids in the world. Together with the state's kleptocracy came a diminished accountability. No one took responsibility for the breakdown in electricity, water and social services. Poverty levels have brought about starvation for millions of people. There is no recourse to the law. And the government, to protect itself and its cronies, has turned to repression as a means of control. It continues to blame its inability to deliver on white capital. As we near 2020, our nation is by and large impoverished. Our natural resources raped. Our infrastructures dilapidated. Power failures and water shortages are commonplace. South Africa's role in Africa has diminished as the country became engulfed by endemic corruption and chaos. It is now 2020. The country has come to a dead end. Is this where South Africa wants to be? The answer is in your hands. Let's take a look at the second scenario, sharp right turn. Here the team explores the possible outcome for South Africa, pursuing initial rapid gains by focusing only on high economic growth in the years leading up to the year 2020. Greetings from the year 2020. By choosing to pursue economic growth above social development, over the past 16 years we have chosen the sharp right turn. A decade after coming to power, the government had successfully managed to reform the country's macroeconomic status. Inflation was brought under control, Interest rates were spurring the economy. The basic standard of living was edging upwards. The growth rate of 2 to 3%, however, was too low to have a meaningful impact on the high unemployment rate and continued poverty of the majority. The government embarked on a single-minded mission to improve the growth rate. Understanding that we had to become globally competitive, it did all it could to comply with global free market fundamentals. Labour laws were relaxed to create a two-tier labour market. Investment in research and development was increased. Government reduced the cost of doing business by providing incentives and lowering taxes in the hope of stimulating exports and foreign direct investment. South Africa's policy of sending out peace missions to the rest of Africa was rapidly followed by its business interests. Its aggressive drive secured huge markets in Africa and South Africa soon came to be known as the Lion of the South. The pursuit of economic growth, however, came at a price. Funds were redirected from social investments into business. The unions were co-opted into business with share option schemes. Greater degrees of automation resulted in unemployment, which was not adequately compensated by extra jobs created by relaxed labour laws. The government set up elitist centres of excellence, which provided education for the few, at the expense of the development of the majority. The criminal justice system was strengthened to clamp down on crime in order to make South Africa a safer place for investors, business and tourists. By 2014, with little or no social support, poverty had reached levels never encountered before and income inequality amongst the highest in the world. To alleviate poverty, the government handed out a basic income grant in the run-up to elections, but this was too little, too late. Voter apathy in the 2014 election saw the lowest voter turnout in the history of South Africa's democracy. Political parties with socialist and leftist leanings emerged to take on the battle for the people. In 2019, after 25 years in power, the ruling party has been defeated in the national election by a coalition of socialist and leftist leaning parties who came to power elected on the promise that they would create jobs for all. Ironically, the same promise made by the ANC 16 years ago, in 2004. The society we have stems from our choices in the past. Does the sharp right turn with emphasis on economic growth produce the society we want? You stand at a point where you can influence this outcome.
Let's take a look at the third scenario, slow puncture. In this scenario, the team explore the possible outcome for South Africa, choosing to beat the same path rather than adopting a bold vision to reduce inequalities in the years leading up to the year 2020. I greet you from 2020. Let us review the events and choices we have taken over the past 16 years. As the air of expectancy, so vibrant in the first decade of freedom, has gradually deflated like a slow puncture. By choosing a cautious path, we have failed to address the fundamental problems of our country. The government's success in the 2004 elections led it to believe it was performing satisfactorily, but they were now acting on fear of rocking the boat. It would continue to look after those with vested interests in the country, accept the country's minor status in the global environment, and attempt to appease all the key stakeholders with conflicting interests. Believing it prudent to be cautious and realistic, and with a firm belief in the correctness and solidity of their position, the government took no bold actions. Accommodating the immediate needs of the populace, the national budget was earmarked for social and developmental requirements. By 2006, 9 million people received social grants, and the expanded public works program provides jobs for tens of thousands, albeit only on a temporary basis. In the meantime, the HIV-AIDS pandemic, while slightly alleviated, started taking its toll. The public departments, still under pressure to perform, experimented with new public management methodologies, but continued to have only limited success. Corruption was curtailed with growing success. The government's South-South initiative began to show initial promise with trading opportunities into the rest of Africa, China and Brazil growing. However, a strong RAND, rising oil prices, interest rates and a difficult global trading environment hampered business development. Attempts to include more people in the benefits of BEE continued to be hindered by a lack of access to capital. By 2014, with the Millennium Goals of halving poverty and eliminating inequality not met, the youth of the day, more educated, skilled and globally aware, remained largely unemployed. They showed their dissatisfaction by voting for opposition and emerging parties, or by not voting at all. The ruling party won just about 50% of the vote in the 2014 elections. For the next five years, a severely weakened government was forced to take an even more cautious approach once more, to stave off pressures from within its own governing alliance, the markets and the opposition parties. South Africa approached its 25th anniversary of freedom in a climate of debate with a disillusioned post-apartheid generation with high expectations of democracy and change being the most vocal. In response, the government pointed out the gains of the past 15 years. However, poverty, inequality and unemployment are an overwhelming reality. The promise of a better life for all has not been delivered to millions of people. The 2019 elections brought in a shock result. For the first time since 1994, no party has an absolute majority. Coalition politics at national and provincial level are now the norm in South Africa in 2020. The expectations of the people have deflated like a slow 16-year puncture, as caution and arrogance resulted in minimal real progress. You in 2004 stand at a point where you can change this outcome. In the fourth and final scenario, all aboard the dual carriageway, the team examined the possible outcome of South Africa adopting and implementing a fundamental shift in its approach to growth and development. Greetings from the year 2020. Let us review the past choices. 16 years ago, we as a country challenged our approach to growth and development and chose to enable all to climb aboard the dual carriageway to a better life. Not long after 2004, having just celebrated our first decade as a democracy, the protesting masses reminded the government that we were still an economically divided nation. Poverty, unemployment, the HIV-AIDS pandemic, slow land reform, poor health care and welfare were the order of the day. Our leaders took the initiative to change their approach to growth and development. Our people having insufficient skills to be drawn into the formal economy 
the informal or secondary economy could no longer be neglected. The values of society had to be redefined, and the leaders reinforced the values of Ubuntu, self-reliance, collaboration, partnering, sustainability, and sacrifice. Instead of being an economy for survival, the secondary economy was intervened upon to ensure it could generate sustainable livelihoods for the 22-odd million people that lived in poverty. Collaboration and partnering between the public, private and labor sectors brought about many positive developments. Self-sustainability was brought about by empowering local government, small-medium enterprises and the community with private sector cooperation to help build local infrastructures and develop the skills and resources required. Combined efforts between communities and police to root out crime ensured safety and protection against violence. Land reform permitted small-scale community agriculture and together with larger-scale agricultural projects helped provide food security. Indigenous knowledge and biodiversity was harnessed to create employment through small manufacturing and beneficiation businesses. Alternative energy and a variety of low-technology projects were initiated within communities to enable self-sustainability while relevant education focused on addressing the needs of the country. HIV and AIDS was destigmatized through active campaigns led by local and national leaders. Effective prevention and treatment programs were enabled by the successful rollout of antiretroviral drugs that were underpinned by community-driven home-based care. At the same time, the primary economy was strengthened by concentrating on lucrative sectors such as tourism, ICT, manufacturing and beneficiation in the mineral and agro-processing sectors. Investment in research and development was also part of the economic growth strategy. No longer the domain of the few, the primary economy was made more inclusive. Broad-based black economic empowerment now included small-medium enterprises and women who received the business support required to establish themselves. Eventually, young black entrepreneurs were breaking into new sectors and leading community developments. By 2015, we had succeeded in reducing poverty to 15%. To live in a township now is not to live in poverty, deprivation and shame. Strengthened local government became accountable, which encouraged a culture of community participation and self-reliance. Active citizenry and punitive anti-corruption measures supported and enforced at national level rooted out corruption and poor services. South Africans from all walks of life were encouraged to act locally and think globally, underpinned by vibrant exchanges and interactions amongst different sectors with other countries. By yet again displaying their innovation in solving development issues, South Africa became the leading force in the regeneration of Africa and a key member of the emerging South-South power axis. Based on a solid value system, we're not only capable of self-sustainability, We've enabled our global competitiveness. All South Africans have been empowered to be aboard the dual carriageway. If this is where we wish to be, South Africa must be wise in the choices that will affect our future.